So we've got three speakers for you this evening. Uh, Wendy Fay, who will be looking at the astrology of Vincent van Gogh's self-portraits. Chris Lee, who will be looking at the English artist Stanley Spencer. And Pamela Armstrong, who will be looking at a Renaissance artist whose identity um, she will reveal later. Um, so we're delighted to welcome our first speaker, Wendy, who's been a member of Aquarius 7 since she moved to the area in 2010. And Wendy has a degree in arts history from the University of Essex and discovered astrology in the 1970s, since when it has remained an abiding interest. So over to you, uh, Wendy. Right, well, hello everyone. Now the, the impulse for this, why self-portraits, came from an observation I made that a self-portrait shows the person in the time they're in experiencing the astrology that they're experiencing, as a photo might, but with a self-portrait, um, that person, is, it takes longer. You really got to look and um, you get oftener, especially when it's a very great artist, um, you get a much more intense sense of the person and what they're actually going through astrologically. So it seemed to me a good way of um, illustrating the astrology. Okay. Now, and Van Gogh is a, a particularly good subject for this because um, he painted quite a few self-portraits and he had a very colourful life and the astrology is really interesting. So let me show you his chart. And this is um, accurate. The, the time is from his um, birth certificate. Apparently it's a double A modern rating. So we're confident about the cancer ascendant. And if I can just highlight, we've got this strong Aries sun and the Sagittarius moon closely conjunct Jupiter in its own sign. That's very, very Jupiterian. Um, and it is also um, the midpoint of those two is on his south node, which suggests that that's difficult for him. And also we have Venus closely conjunct Mars up here in Pisces, which is associated with the arts. Um, and all of this with the moon being his, um, the ruler of his ascendant, suggests extreme sensitivity, an abundance of energy. I mean, he was, he, he never stopped. Um, very little earth and no air at all. So I, I think he had trouble um, standing back and getting any sort of perspective on what he was doing. He just galloped off with his impulses. Um, what else? Oh, the earth planets. Now he does have a little bit of earth, surprisingly for someone who is so totally impractical. But, um, they're really not integrated with the rest of his chart, but the Saturn's got a trine to Chiron, and that's about all, really. I think it's sextiles to Neptune, which possibly is what made it possible for him to produce anything at all, because he did work extraordinarily hard. Um, his energy was extraordinary. Okay, I'll do, give you a quick outline of his life, although I think it's fairly well known. Um, he was born into a pious and very respectable small Dutch family in the 19th century. Um, they had strong links to the art trade, so um, he was aware of the arts as a, as a trade from an early age. He was very well educated, very widely read. Um, idealistic to the point of mania, uh, which is perhaps not surprising when you, oh no, sorry, wrong way. Not surprising when you look at that Sagittarian idealism with 
the Piscean idealism, both closely square, so they're, they're just linked together. It's boundless, really. Um, okay. So being brought up, his father was a pastor, so he was brought up very um, Christian, very religious. Um, so he thought he tried preaching, he tried being an art dealer, he tried being a teacher, um, but none of this really worked because um, he just wasn't practical enough, really. Some of his sermons went on for hours, apparently. Um, and were far too dense and strange for people, just not grounded in their lives, all up in the air. Um, so he failed to make a living at all. And then in the 1880s, uh, 86, he first moved to Paris, where his brother was living and his brother supported him throughout his life. Um, he made no money himself. But Paris at that time, 1888, 86, was alive with the um, Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists and that exposed him to an entirely new way of seeing. Prior to that, um, he was rooted in a sort of Dutch moralistic, um, rather sentimental type of art, which is what he liked and admired. But um, going to Paris really opened his eyes. And I, he's, he's painted so many paintings. The rate of production was just extraordinary. Um, and virtually all of the paintings that we know, and there are many of them, only painted five versions of the sunflowers, I think, um, they were all painted in the last five years. So his output was just extraordinary. He would do one a day for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, as is well known, mental instability caught up with him in the end. That, um, that Mercury is square to, I forget, but it is somewhat... Um, unstable and it's in Aries so it's it's got it's just so energetic it's um, goes to excess uh, and then he spent some 18 months in men's mental institutions and he really was quite deranged they had to restrain him at times in a straitjacket and whatever and um, he would he would have delusions and um, religious fantasies where his pictures would come alive and um, so he, he really was quite disturbed. But um, this is when he produced some of his greatest work. And as is also well known, he died from a, a gunshot wound, which was assumed at the time, or not so much, anyway, it has been assumed to be suicide, but that has been questioned, so who knows. Um, also, his brother Theo, they, they were very, very close, um, and Theo was completely um, his complete support. He paid for his whole expenses throughout his life. He died not long after, um, from what I interpret, this is my own interpretation, of being syphilitic degeneration of the brain, because it was rife at the time, and... Um, didn't mean to do that. And uh, he died, I mean, people made a sentimental assumption that it was a um, despair at the loss of his brother, but I think there was more to it than that. Anyway, there are various um, transits and progressions and so on that I have, I have got a list of them. But I won't bother to show you the list because it's much easier to see them actually on a chart. And this is the first of the series. This is um, his earliest self-portrait. And as you can see in my clunky bit of um, notation on the side there, trying to write on an iPad, um, at the time he 
was experiencing the transit of Saturn right on his very sensitive ascendant. And it's my contention that um, you can see that in the portrait, the self-portrait. It's dark, he's anxious. He was at the time facing up to the reality that if he's gonna be an artist, he'd better really get on with it and um, make a go of it. So he, he was uh, making a serious attempt to be a successful artist. And I just think it's so Cancerian, the way he's gripping that pipe. It's a sort of um, security pipe. He's anxious and fearful. And that shows what Saturn on the Ascendant, on a Cancerian Ascendant, can feel like. Oh, it was square his um, Mercury as well. So, um, reality check. And that's when he went to um, Paris as a way of thinking, I've got to make a go of this. He, he went to the academy and did all the proper academic exercises and so on. And then, um, uh, later on in 86, sorry, by the autumn, the next one, same year, in the autumn, look how different he's looking. He's still anxious because the Saturn's only just moved off, but um, he's got, by solar arc, he's got Venus conjunct his Pluto. Um, and it seems to me this is, it's still dark and serious, but it's beginning to glow with colour, which to me expresses Venus Pluto really quite well. And it's in Taurus, which is a sort of, um, there's a glow of the earth there. And at the same time, he's got this um, transit from Uranus opposite his sun. So he's being stirred up. He's being exposed this year to all the avant-garde um, life in Paris. And um, I think you can see in his face that he's beginning to think there might be another way. Maybe I don't have to be this serious, fearful person. I think he's beginning to see a path for himself there. And then by the spring of 87, he looks so much lighter. And here we've got um, the progressed moon has moved to his midheaven. So um, to me, this is quite a, a a lunar looking, the colouring is lunar, it's delicate, it's um, almost like moonlight and is um, beginning to emerge from the gloom, I'd say. At the same time, um, Jupiter was transiting into his fifth house of creativity, which for an art, I mean, Jupiter is obviously crucially important to him given his natal chart um, and as an artist in the fifth. Um, it was really helpful to him, I think. I think the creative juices um, really began to flow. His gaze is still very intense, but there's, that's, um, it's sort of watery and sensitive as well. People tend to think and naturally associate Van Gogh with yellow because that was his great love. But I also think there's a blueness to his paintings that are, um, is, reflects his Cancer Pisces um, planets and ascendant. Um, he was extremely sensitive as well as, as um, being frankly a bit of a nightmare to be with. <laughs> 
because um, he just wouldn't stop talking, apparently. So by the winter of that year, things are lightening up even more. The progressed moon has moved on to the um, very important Mars-Venus conjunction in Pisces there. So that's triggering them off. And it's just nice to see him in the sunlight a bit. Although this is a winter picture. And we're also here beginning to see his, his very distinctive style developing. He's becoming his own person um, instead of trying to just be like his father or be like his brother or be like someone else. Um, I think it's striking that he's not looking directly at us here. I think his eyes are on the um, on the horizon a bit. He's beginning to see forward instead of peering out at us. I think he's beginning to see somewhere he can go. And then he moved famously to the south of France with his progressed moon moving into Aries and then conjuncting his sun. So it's all a lot more fiery and warm. He's, he's, he's in the light. You can see the um, sun's been at him. He's all pink. And I wanted to draw your attention to the pipe. If you remember the pipe right at the beginning, it was sort of clutched. Um, it was his security. Um, but here, he's a lot more relaxed about that pipe. I mean, he was a total tobacco addict. He smoked constantly. Um, always had, I think, as people did. But here it's, it's, not, um, it's not so tense. He's a lot more relaxed. He's beginning to think he's found a way of being a little more comfortable in himself for a little while anyway. And then by that winter, We see him come on again. I mean, his mastery is, has just moved on enormously. It's, it's, it's only two years since he went to Paris. His development's extraordinary. But then with that um, Aries content in his chart, um, he, wasn't, he was in a hurry. He, you know, he wasn't going to take, take anything slowly, threw himself into things. Um, and here we have, and now famously, he had this dream of the yellow house in Arles where he'd have an artist colony. As a cancer, cancer rising, he wanted his own, he wanted to make his own little family. He was a disaster with women. That didn't work. But he wanted his own little family of artists, so he invited Gauguin. Um, and they, they didn't get on, really. So he's in, at this point, he's in the middle of that. And we have, um, by solar arc, we've got Saturn opposing his moon. So he's trying to make the dream real, finding it harder. You know, it's, um, he hasn't sold a single painting and it's, he's still relying on Theo and that, that bothered him mightily. But at the same time, he's got solar arc Mars trining the Jupiter and Moon and the transiting Jupiter conjunct his Moon and Jupiter conjunction. So that's come round again. Now you think, well, that's nice. But um, Van Gogh was prone to excess. And I think this just exacerbated um, an unfortunate lack of restraint. 
or lack of stability anyway. Um, so here we see him determined. He knows what he wants to do and, and his colour sense is amazing. His skill is amazing. It's completely original. No one else paints like this. Um, fitting for an Aries to be a, a pathfinder like that. It doesn't work for him to try and be like other people. It just never worked. But he's finding his, finding his feet here. But he's a bit worried that Saturn is weighing on his moon because um, it's not going well with Goga and he still hasn't sold anything. And the next one um, is after the incident with the ear, famous painting. This was actually painted in the spring of 1889. Um, and that Jupiter transit that was con still conjunct his, his moon and Jupiter um, was squaring his um, Mars and Venus closely um, and it's all got a bit too much. I think that that's what I mean about the Jupiter in excess. I think he didn't have the stability to cope with it. And so he injured himself. I think he looks dazed, understandably, and um, still smoking a pipe. It's, I looked, um, those Jupiter transits, which seem, I mean, so painful for him here. I looked back at the previous two around the age of 12 and around the age of 24. And it's interesting, the, um, the one in his childhood was when he was sent away to boarding school, which gave him a good education, I believe, but as a Cancerian, he hated being away from home and they were pretty harsh, I think. Um, so it gave him a sort of freedom, a sort of intellectual freedom of the education, but, um, it was a, it was not an enjoyable part of his life. And, and then again, at the age of around 24, that's when he was trying to make his way as a preacher appropriately for Jupiter in Sagittarius. And he just threw himself into it. Damn near killed him. He said in one of his letters, um, he threw himself into the Christian life and gave away all his clothes and all his food and, and just, um, wasn't very successful at it really. He, had, he went to um, the coal mining area in Belgium, which was the, the poorest, the, the darkest, and you know, it was very, very harsh, middle of the or late 19th century. Um, and he just went to um, be with the poorest of the poor, which he took as the Christian message. But he went too far. Um, and they, he just frightened them actually. They, uh, that's not what they wanted. They wanted someone to um, not be part of them. They wanted someone to lead them. Or at least that's what the church said. So this time round, the third Jupiter transit through that part of his chart um, is when he injures himself and it all goes um, very, very unstable. Now, the next one, uh, he was committed to um, a mental institution for a while and then he later on um, voluntarily went because he knew it was unstable. And this was painted in um, that session when he was in the asylum at St. Remy, um, where he painted some marvelous some of his finest works, um, but he was also deeply troubled. And I looked up his, his progressed moon, I haven't actually got it on, on here, but it was at the time precisely, this September, it was precisely trying his natal moon, which is his ruling planet, of course. 
And look how it looks like moonlight to me. And is is um, there's all this swirling energy, which is not quite overwhelming. He's he's managed to put it on a canvas with great control, actually, and sensitivity and subtlety. I mean, you can see that face is a man who's been through the mill and um, is still not broken. So at this point, his um, progressed Venus was trying that Chiron. Now, I'm not terribly familiar with Chiron, but um, it suggests that perhaps he was finding some healing. It's a trine, it's Venus. Um, and it's just a very, very beautiful painting, I think. But he knows he's not out of the woods. You can see that in his eyes. It's a serious matter. He's in an asylum. And that's the end of the self-portrait. There is a later, slightly later one, but it's disputed and um, I thought you'd just like to see his chart again. And that's the journey Van Gogh took. Okay, thank you very much, Wendy. If you have any... Thank you. I have um... got a bit of details about his death if you're interested, but I thought I'd leave it there. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I think uh, if if you can if you can do it within say about three minutes, if that's not too yeah. <laughs> hurried. It's it is interesting. It is interesting because um, famously he he died very young, aged just thirty seven. Um, so as I say here, his progressed moon. Right. Yes. On virtually on the day of the shooting, conjuncted conjuncted his Pluto. Um, also that month, Saturn was trying his Pluto. Further emphasis on on that planet. Um, Saturn as well. Solar arc Saturn had come round to um, exactly conjunct his Saturn. Um, transiting Chiron was conjunct his natal ascendant. And then um, a, a little, a few weeks earlier, I think, uh, and then squared his natal Mercury. Um, so there's a lot on Pluto at this point and um, you could, oh, there, there you are. Um, you could say he'd sort of run out of road, not that a progressive moon on Pluto means that, but um, it was a tough time. Yeah, that's, that's a lot, a lot of transits and progressions. <laughs> well, that's yeah. right. And, and the precision of that moon on the Pluto was, um, was interesting. It's, it's all, it's, it's always more than one thing, isn't it? And, and he's got, several things going on here. Um, he thought he was getting better and um, he was still painting, um, you know, vigorously, fiercely, daily. Never a day went by without him painting. But he was adrift and um, we'll never know whether it was an accident or suicide. Okay. I rather doubt the suicide. Many thanks, Wendy. Thank you for that, Wendy. And um, yeah, it's interesting to look at self-portraits. I've got a few in my um, presentation oh, good. as well, although I've not looked at the transits, but it would be interesting to, to do that. So mm. I'll do my uh, uh, screen share now. So yeah, I've got about say 15, 20 minutes to talk about Stanley Spencer. So um, 
yeah, obviously a chart is very complex, but I thought as it's a shortish talk, it could almost be a talk on Venus in Gemini, or at least Venus in Gemini in a T-square with Jupiter and Saturn. I have uploaded his chart to the chat window if you want to download it, but I will be putting it on screen a couple of times. So what do we say about an artist who is so versatile? So we've got a couple of self-portraits here. The, the 1957 one, actually he's painted in the background part of what he was working on at the time. This is shortly before his death. A vast, and as it turned out, unfinished work called Christ Preaching at Cookham Regatta. More of his religious paintings later. This portrait he donated to Cookham Village Bazaar to raise funds for the village. Um, but if you'd gone to auction in 2013, you could have acquired that for £386,000. Um, I wonder what it fetched originally to, for the village. That's quite cheap for a, a, a Spencer work, actually. So, yeah, the different styles that he had. So there were the landscapes. Um, at its height, he was, one year he did 40 of these. The reason will become clearer later. And they're quite typical in that they often have things you don't normally expect in a landscape like pigs or corrugated iron roofs. But when you see them in real life, they're incredibly detailed and almost photographic. And the thing you really need to know about him is that they're almost all set round Cookham, where he was born. This is Cookham, a village on the Thames in Berkshire. When he studied at the Slade, along with another, a number of other famous artists, he used to insist on catching the train back to Cookham in the evenings rather than having the high artistic bohemian life in, in London. And uh, for a while, he was known as Cookham Spencer by his, his uh, fellow students. And it's an attachment that remained with him all his life. And then we have the portraits. And there's kind of this sort of relatively realistic portrait, two from 1945 here when he was working in Glasgow. The psychiatrist is someone called Charlotte Murray, who he was actually having a uh, an affair with at the time. I don't know if he was a client, let's hope not. Um, yeah, it's quite, it's a very well executed portrait. And then we've got the Furnace Man. This is one of the workers in the Glasgow shipyards. So he's taking time there just to paint ordinary people. He was always very interested in, in that, I think. And they kind of his portraits to me kind of often seem to catch the soul of the person at the time but then there are also the more i would say visceral portraits or hyper realistic portraits maybe they're not quite realistic and yet they're very revealing so this is his first wife hilda carline who is also a painter and his older daughter unity and this is painted at a time when their relationship is about to break up into divorce. And we have the Scorpionic Hilda not engaging with the artist, the child looking maybe accusingly, and these strange, some dead eyed dolls. Um, it's a very, I find that quite a, a visceral, it's a, it's a brilliant piece of work. And then we have the sort of the style of painting that he's more, I guess, best known for. So this is painted much later after Hilda has died. And this is part of his plan, this series of paintings for the, the Chapel of Hilda, which was going to be filled with paintings of Hilda, who he absolutely adored. And he had a grander project actually for the Church of Me, which was going to be, have a grand plan um, based on the outline of Cookham and would have various side chapels where his works would be exhibited in celebration of the people and places he knew and in life generally. And so in this Hilda and I, he's reflecting on an earlier time 
that he felt was quite idyllic. I don't think Hilda found it quite so idyllic. And you see the characteristic primitive quality, the fact that he often places himself in his paintings and the strange perspectives. Some of the paintings are really quite flat and the perspectives are all wrong. He, he lets go of this idea of being perspective, which we know he can do from his, his landscapes. And so then we have the, the, the war artist. So he served in the First World War. He was a medical orderly at a hospital in Bristol. And then he saw active service in Macedonia, which it wasn't particularly gruelling out there. Um, that's not to diminish it at all. And so top left, we have uh, a scene of this is tea in, in the hospital. Um, and this arose because when he came back, he was commissioned to work on the interior of what is known as the Sandham Memorial Chapel in Burghclere, not far from Cookham. And this was a memorial to Lieutenant Henry Willoughby Sandham and a general war memorial. And so there, you can go and see this, it's owned by the National Trust now. And there are 16 paintings around the side walls of everyday scenes of the hospital and army life. So it's not a conventional war memorial, but they're drawn from his own experience. And then top right, we have what you get behind the altar. And this is one of his characteristics, uh, motifs. So what's happening here is that the soldiers who died in the war are resurrecting. It's the, end, it's the time of the resurrection and they're coming out of the graves, throwing away their crosses and in various states of um, emotion, I guess. And we even have some mules who seem to be resurrecting as well. Earlier, he painted his first really well-known work, The Resurrection Cookham, which has a similar theme. People in Cookham Churchyard coming to life again in in pure in, in body and in mind and often very kind of sort of dazed or adoring and delightful, delightfully joyful about the people they're being reunited with. The picture at the bottom is from his later war artist when he was an official war artist. He was sent to Glasgow and he painted the shipyards and there's a whole series of these, these uh, paintings which you can see in Glasgow and it really shows how good he is with movement and groups of individuals. And they just show the workmen in the shipyard. This is, in some ways, it's quite groundbreaking in that he's just showing everyday people. And one might wonder how this rather well-spoken artist from Berkshire coped in the rough and tumble of the shipyards with people. I mean, they probably had trouble understanding each other verbally because of their accents. But the men seemed to love him. He, was, he seemed to be fearless. He would just climb up gantries and, and get really in the thick of things to get different perspectives. And he had this habit, he could just do little sketches of the workers, which was, I think, a miracle to them that someone could do that. And also the people were bothering to do that about ordinary working class people. So it seems that they really loved him. And then we have the more religious paintings. And the key to these paintings is largely that they're set in his mind in everyday life in Cookham. This isn't Jerusalem, it's Cookham High Street. This is an, an early example of his religious work. So it's putting those religious scenes into everyday contemporary life. And then the much the slightly stranger St Francis and his birds, which I, I really love. Uh, again, is probably a local roof and a local woman he's got there. He's probably in awe of the saints, the birds um, totally adoring or engaged. And the strange body shape and the, the uh, interesting slippers and the hands which aren't quite right. And of course, the strange head. He did do some conventional subjects. You have a, a nativity and again you have this really sort of I think it's adoration and the crucifixion is one of two that he did it's very unusual to have violence in his his work 
this late one it's very large this it's it's larger than life size and again both both the cruise fictions he did are set in cookham and kind of implicating the local people in the crucifixion it brings it more home it seems to me often that the standard crucifixion iconography is almost sort of beautiful and obviously this is much more realistic it's really showing the horror and and these these are actually modeled on real people um, for example the the chappie with the hammer on the left we actually know who that person is it's someone it's someone in cookham who was quite surprised to find out that he'd been a, a model so so here's one look at his chart so yeah a lot of gemini cancer mix there maybe the cancer is that attachment to to place but we've got the venus in gemini is that a multiplicity of of styles very versatile but we can see it's squaring both jupiter and saturn so jupiter in pisces see what you think of that opposite saturn in in virgo jupiter of course is in its rulership in pisces it's taking an already broad unbounded sign and taking it further and saturn kind of sort of neutral in Virgo but you think it's maybe quite reasonably placed in Virgo but maybe Saturn has trouble gets too involved with the detail so if we're looking at Venus in Germany we ought to look at his personal relationships as well so in the 1930s he had Neptune came along and it was it's there when he's born it's gone all the way around here it's transiting saturn it gets to that point which means over the next few years it's also squaring the venus there and opposite the jupiter so that's quite a few years of an outer planet transiting and activating that t-square so his personal relationships as we saw he was well, as i mentioned he was um one might say obsessed with with Hilda. he absolutely adored her and fantasized about her. one of the proposed paintings for the chapel was apotheosis of hilda this is hilda sort of created as a godlike figure and in the 1930s he became involved with this woman patricia priest and similarly he just absolutely adored her he was fairly well off at the time showered her with gifts and um this went on for quite a few years the two women were kind of trying to negotiate the situation i think but eventually it became intolerable for hilda stanley thought there was no reason why he couldn't have two wives i'm sure a lot of you with venus and gemini don't actually think that but it would be a classic kind of thing to uh, reading for that um but of course the the two women didn't really see it that way hilda was starting to have mental health problems and they got divorced a few weeks later spencer and priest were married and that's that's the wedding photograph um it gives you a sense of spencer's eccentricity maybe now the woman on the left of the photograph is called dorothy hepworth and the big snag in this relationship was that priest and hepworth were lovers they'd they were committed lesbians they lived together for a few times priest was an, an aquarian and didn't seem to mind being unconventional so on the wedding night priest and hepworth went off on honeymoon to st ives stanley stayed at cookham and invited hilda down um, this arrangement kind of didn't uh, last hilda withdrew more and more Priest is rather a difficult character to to say nice things about. Obviously, it's difficult if someone is obsessing over you and chasing you. But she did kind of lead him on, and she then wanted to be maintained by him. And he was also having to maintain Hilda and the children. Hence the landscape painting, which he had to do because he could sell those very readily. 
priest eventually, after a few years, evicted Spencer from his home in Cookham. And the other strange thing about her is that she was an artist, and it turned out much later in her life that all the paintings were being carried out by Hepworth, and Priest was just signing them. And even after Priest died, Hepworth continued to do that and put Priest's signature. So there's a, that's another very strange story. And the, both of them are, are buried in Cookham Churchyard in the same grave, which must have been maybe quite controversial at the time. And we see these very sort of visceral portraits, uh, nude portraits he did at the time, which were quite, quite shocking. And there was there were some rumours of an obscenity trial at some point. It didn't actually happen. And then we have this a, a, another lovely portrait, I think. So Daphne Charlton, he became involved with Daphne and her husband George in the 1930s after after. Um, the priest marriage obviously wasn't going to work out. It was never consummated, as far as we know. So Daphne was an artist and her husband George was quite high up. I think he was director of the Slade at the time. And um, yeah, you look at these portraits and they're, they're quite from warts and all. It's, it's, she's very beautiful, but he's kind of, yeah, slightly... The one eye is slightly different to the other. Anyway, it's probably very realistic. So they go on, travel around a bit, come down to Leonard Stanley, just down the road from us here in, in Cheltenham. And Spencer has an affair with, with Daphne. He becomes very obsessed and adoring of her. George doesn't seem to mind too much. He's certainly aware of it. And the three of them did stay friends for the rest of their lives. Daphne, very strong-willed woman apparently so he also did then paintings again like this in the other style so this is the wool shop uh, at stone house again near here and it's almost like they're to me as though they're in love with the wool it's very it's very sensual about the fabric and here we have the rather formidable looking daphne spencer was on the short side and daphne was quite tall and he also did this this was another painting which you can see in the, the Wilson Gallery in Cheltenham. And this is the village people in Leonard Stanley expressing their displeasure at this extramarital relationship that was taking place in their, in their midst. And Daphne looking very sort of formidable and defiant that Spencer and Daphne weren't too concerned about this, I don't think. He also carried on with the religious style of paintings um, oh, no, I'll come to that next. I just wanted to say these are the other sort of works he was doing, the Beatitudes, a whole series of paintings of rather grotesque figures, usually of which he is one. But the idea seems to be that there is beauty in everything and even people we don't or things we don't regard as beautiful in themselves generally are still capable of love and being loved and adored. And then on the left, we have this very strange painting, which people often find quite disturbing. It shows a dustman being reunited with his wife. And um, Spencer said as a child, he loved going through people's dustbins because it said, it said so much about them and he became attached to their things. And uh, another, maybe his most well-known quote was, I'm on the side of the angels and dirt. Um, so yes, so he did carry on with the religious works as well. So just back at his chart again, what can we say? And again, just maybe focusing on the T-square, but yeah, we've mentioned the Cancerian attachment to place that seems to be quite important. And that Mercury and Gemini rising, like the time is relatively accurate. And yeah, he was a, um, he was a very sort of, you can find some film of him online. He's, he's very kind of, um, I don't know, well, Venus, uh, Mercury and Gemini Rising, I, I, I'd say. And he's, he's very kind of charming and almost quite light considering his, his subject matter. And um, yeah, he wasn't kind of very sociable, but nevertheless, he was quite, entertaining and 
then we have the T-square that I've been focusing on. So the Venus in, in Gemini, maybe those styles of art and maybe the different relationships. And then Jupiter in Pisces, that sort of all loving, all encompassing universal love of everything, maybe. I don't think he really did kind of hate. Um, he seems to just go through all these very stressful periods of his life. Hilda, he carried on seeing to the end and he supported her in a final illness and remained, they both remained very attached. She said to him a few weeks before she died, and I, I paraphrase this, um, being with Stanley is like being with a holy person. It isn't that he is consciously good or bad or intentionally anything, for he is a thing that so many strive for. Stanley's home seems to be the whole world. And then we have the Saturn in Virgo, I guess that's quite good for a painter and gives you that attention to detail maybe, but it's also potentially quite obsessive. He was a tremendous writer of lists. In fact, he was a tremendous writer all round. There's a vast archive of his, of his letters and he made quite detailed notes on his work, some of which you can see online. And um, yeah, his kind of philo philosophical ideas, I guess. So I just finished with a few portraits uh, over the years, which you can see they're kind of in different styles. There's one I haven't shown that is it's a, a very large, larger than life, I think, from remembering when I saw it, full frontal nude. Um, you could think that is maybe extremely exhibitionistic which it may be but it's also maybe one of the most exposing things you might do as an artist and the self-portraits they're kind of yeah they're often no holds barred it seems to me and the last one bottom right is one of his last works it's not long before his death when he's when he's dying with with cancer um, I always think he's very good on spectacles, painting people's spectacles. Um, there's, there's one really nice portrait. I can't remember the name of the person now, but the guy, the guy's spectacles, they're, they're like this. And um, most artists would have said, put your specs on straight, mate, or I'll paint them properly. But no, he does them like that. Obviously, it's something I've said something to him about the guy. So I'll finish with just one final quote from Spencer himself. He said, quite late in life when asked about his works, he said, everything has a sort of double meaning for me. There's the ordinary everyday meaning of things and the imaginary meaning about it all. And I wanted to bring those things together, which maybe is a good way of summing up that T-square we've been looking at. So thank you for that. That's a very quick tour of who I, what I think is a, a wonderful, fascinating artist. And I will be handing you on now shortly to uh, Pamela. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So, uh, Pamela, if you'd like to take over. So I'm going to be talking about something entirely different and it's slightly self-reflexive because um, I, I want to talk a little bit um, about um, the journey that I took to choosing the artist that I'm going to focus on tonight. And that is that when I first knew I was going to be giving this short presentation, I, um, I wanted to do something modern and uh, something very new and of the moment because I'm just currently with what's going on in 2020 and with what we're living through at this time, I'm, I'm for myself very aware of a before and after and I find increasingly I'm only interested in what has come after in terms of when the pandemic started and when the pandemic didn't and I'm, everything before then has sort of lost its traction for me because I think I think we are completely remaking our world. And, um, and I'm just sort of really, really interested in, in that. So when I look at things or think about things or consider things or watch things or anything to do with art, I actually want it to be current and right now because I want to see how our artists are doing things. So I was going to go with Ai Weiwei, um, who is um, the, the Chinese artist and um, began looking into his work and discovered that he's actually just made a documentary 
um, which is his, really his latest work. And um, it, unfortunately, it really unfortunate because I actually don't want to go into the COVID thing too much. It's actually a documentary about a hospital in China and how they managed COVID. So I didn't want to go down that road because that was, that's just, you know, we're talking about art and lovely things. So I don't want to talk about COVID. So then I was, um, so what was I going to talk about? Because I don't want to talk about this. This is my idea in 20, and I'm very aware that um, we've got Mars in retrograde, with the fire coming out of the windows. We've had Saturn-Pluto conjunction at the beginning of the year, which is the breaking down of the structures and the changing of everything. And this, this very much captured um, what I've been thinking. It's a photograph by David LaChapelle. La La it's a fashion photograph. It has in it Alexander McQueen and Isabella Blow. And I was thinking, I don't want to go there. So I was thinking, where am I going to go? And um, I was idly whiling away my life on Twitter on the 24th of August. And I saw this painting and I just thought, oh, isn't that lovely? And I just thought, well, you know, let's have a look and see who that is. And maybe, maybe I'll do that. Um, that artist and so so what I did was I did some research and it turns out that's an artist called Lavinia Fontana so that's I wanted to talk about my journey towards discovering and thinking about Lavinia because it was very much a reaction to not going down a lot of this a lot of the um, the things that we have all had to and continue to deal with on a daily basis in a way that is unsettling for many of us at this time so Lavinia, so I thought, yeah, okay, this will be safe. We'll go with Lavinia. And uh, she was born on the 24th of August, 1552. She died on the 11th of August, 1614. And she was one of Europe's first truly successful female painters with the largest attributable oeuvre of any woman artist before the 18th century. She was actually huge. Um, there are about 100 paintings that are thought, it's thought that she did, and 38 of them are verified, they're authenticated, they're signed by her. And uh, this is her chart. And there we have it, at the bottom, a partile Saturn-Pluto conjunction. There is just no way of getting away from it. So I decided to dive in. And there's much going on in the chart that's really interesting, but I'm only going to focus, given that I was trying to get away from it, given that it chased me down through the eons. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to capitulate and I'm just going to look at the Saturn Pluto in her chart and to think about that. So it obviously has that incredible um, opposition, an incredibly tight opposition. It is itself an incredibly tight conjunction. Um, it's an, it has a very tight opposition to Venus. So we have the, um, an interesting stress and tension uh, to do with uh, women, money, um, creating things, making things. And also she has this um, wonderful quintile to Neptune. Um, and I always think of quintiles as just, um, just when grace descends on a chart. It's a very, it's a very, um, it can confer very great skill if you choose to use it and to explore with it. Um, it can uh, make you extremely good um, at something that you might choose to do. If there is, if you have a talent, it can make it superb and very special. So here we have Lavinia Fontana with this, with this incredibly rogue Saturn Pluto. It's um, anoretic. It's uh, 29 degrees, absolutely, but it has this grace, this moment of grace with Neptune, but it has this obsessive dynamic quality with Venus opposite it. So what was her life like? So I'm going to look at one particular year in her life, which was when she was 24, 25, uh, because that was a marker of time when she established herself in ways that, that simply then followed on from there. So in 19... In, in 1577, she did a particular self-portrait that was significant and that was very interesting, and she also got married. Um, and this was the self-portrait. Um, and what was significant about this self-portrait was that it was unusual and it broke the convention. So there we have 
the Saturn Pluto, which was breaking things down, it was in the third house, uh, the way she's going to communicate about her immediate environment is going to be challenging and she's going to reconstruct it, particularly with that opposition to Venus. She's going to use art to do that. And there's going to be a stress and attention. And the thing about this portrait was that it is a statement by a, a 25 year old saying, um, I may have grown up as an artisan. I may have grown up as someone who's a painter, but she was taught by her father. Um, but um, I am going to establish myself with status in my community and I'm going to have wealth and I'm going to have um, material goods. Um, I'm going to display my wealth and I'm going to rise above my station. And not only that, she was a woman. Her marriage was astounding. Um, she basically made a contract with her husband um, that she would continue painting. She was the talented one. Her father recognized her as talented. And um, the deal she made with her husband was that he would look after the children. And she had 11 children. And the marriage was successful and it continued throughout her life. And that was the deal. And I mean, that in, even, in, even in this day and age would be unusual. You, can you imagine it in Renaissance times? It was an absolutely groundbreaking uh, contract that she made with this man. And so here again, we have the Saturn Pluto opposite the Venus, um, but with this wonderful quintile to Neptune because it worked and there was grace. And he became, he looked after the children, he, he wrote her contracts, he was her, in a sense, her producer, he got her clients, he basically ran everything and he made sure she had the time and space to work as an artist. Now, the thing that I think brought her to this place was actually when her secondary progress Venus became quincunx to that Pluto Saturn in the summer of, nine, of 1576. And that's actually when she began to break out of the mold. She broke out of her father's atelier and set up on her own as a painter. And it's that uncomfortable, uncomfortable quincunx when you have when something suddenly gives and something has to something has to change. You don't necessarily control it. But Venus had moved on and it was putting that that quincunctial pressure on that Saturn Pluto down in the third. And then hence the marriage, then hence uh, this astounding statement, public statement about how she intended to live her life and what she was going to create in her life. What happened at that time too in, in 1577 was the transiting nodes were semi-square Pluto-Saturn in July of the year and transiting Saturn was semi-square Pluto-Saturn in December. So in that year, this, this, this pivotal year, when, which was a watershed in her life, she had these uncomfortable semi-squares where she would have felt very great frustration. And out of that came this astounding thing that she did, which was she set up an urban workshop. Now, the thing that was so different about her, apart from her um, breaking convention and establishing herself as someone who was going to change her status herself, and contracting into this extremely unusual marriage was she didn't paint within the confines of a convent, which is where if there were female artists, they would be safe within convents and they would do religious works. Neither was she safe within a court, which is where if there were female artists and they were rare, they would be safe within a court. She did this thing of setting up her own studio Again, incredibly radical. And there you have the Saturn Pluto saying, I will do it. I will do it my way. I'll break the conventions and I'll make my, my new conventions and they'll be new and Aquarian and different. These are the kinds of work she could do. I'm not going to talk about it. I wanted to just show this simply for the size. So she's done 100 paintings. We know 38 of them are for sure hers. These are the kinds of things she would do when she was commissioned. She was a really major pa painter. Forget whether, she was a, whether there was a male-female uh, dynamic in the equation. She was astoundingly good. But there's one thing, I'm, the thing I'm now going to talk about in terms of that Saturn Pluto is if you look to the right of that painting and you see that group, and it's clearly a court, a court of some sort, those are all women. And Lavinia Fontana had an astounding relationship with women. They really, really liked her. And she 
majored on women in her work. And so, so for instance, this is a Sylvan Glade. They're all women. And the reason that was such a smart and canny move I'll just read. The, I'll just read this um, because she was a rock star essentially in Bologna, where she grew up. For some time, all the ladies of the city would compete in wishing to have her close to them, treating her and embracing her with extraordinary demonstrations of love and respect, considering themselves fortunate to have seen her on the street or to have meetings in the company of the virtuous young woman. The greatest thing that they desired would be to have her paint their portrait prizing them in such a way that in our day no greater prices could be charged by others such as Van Dyck or Monsu Giusto or Carlo Cesare Malvasia. So she became a rock star and the reason she did and the reason she was so successful she was extremely commercially canny because what she spotted in the Renaissance in Bologna which was also a center for commerce and industry was that um, many women were wealthy and they could afford to have their paintings taken. She had 11 children. She had godmothers for all of them. She built up a network of godmothers and they became her patrons. They didn't, she didn't just do portraits for them. She would do um, religious pictures. She would do all sorts of different paintings for them. But she, her focus was on the women in her community. They had the money and that was a smart and canny move. I'm now just going to show you a few of her paintings. She would display their wealth. There was a sorority. There was a community of women. She was well known for being able to paint in, in a most exquisite fashion, velvet and jewels and satins, silks, lace. Finally, as I come to a close, the thing that I think she was most iconoclastic about was that she took her women, who she had become very confident of representing, and she gave them epic stories. This is Cleopatra. This is simply called Cleopatra, but it could be one of her neighbors. And it's a really unusual design in painting. It's weirdly modernist. It's, it's, she, had, she had an extraordinary vision, an extraordinary eye, an enormous confidence that she could turn out a painting like this. And this is Judith and Holofernes, which, you know, Judith sliced off Holofernes' head and that just could be her next door neighbor. But she's put her in an iconic uh, role in an, in, an, in an epic story, and she's mythologized her. So this is a real change in the way um, women were portrayed, the way women were portrayed, were portrayed by women. And this is what makes um, Lavinia Fontana such an unusual artist. And I think very, very special. When she died, I'm just going to put up her death chart very briefly because I just found it very poignant because it bears down on that Saturn-Pluto conjunction. At the beginning of the, year, of the year of her death, Uranus was at 28 degrees, bearing down on that 29 degrees of the Saturn-Uranus. Neptune was at 28 degrees. Mars was at 28 degrees. Chiron was at 28 degrees. They were coming to take her home. She was considered one of Europe's first truly successful female painters. And as I said, with the largest attributable oeuvre of any woman artist before the 18th century. Thank you very much.